Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Chapter 6. <laughs> uh, before we get into the message today, I want to say a huge thank you um, to Nathan and Lori DeBoer. If you notice, we have blinds today. Thus, you are not blinded by all the light coming in the, the, the side windows. Uh, Lori put the, all the project together and Nathan got them hung and we want to say thank you guys very much for your work. So today, I am shooting to wrap up the series on money. And um, I want to kind of recap before we get into today's message, because today's message is the one that I think is the most difficult for us to master. Okay? So, to, to review, um, we started off with whose is it? It's God's money. It's, it's all God's. All the money, all the stuff, everything is His. And, and this extends even to your spouse, your parents, your children. It's all his. It all belongs to him. He made it. It's his. As Christians, we become aware of our status, which is not possessors, but stewards. Okay? That means that I am using his stuff supposedly on his behalf. Okay? He gives to me that I might prosper his kingdom, his business. Okay? So we have to start from the foundation that it's not mine, it's his, okay? We start there. It's all his, everything else depends on that. So then we moved on to how you make money. It matters. This is important because we are called to be people of integrity. We're called to be people of honesty, to be upright. We are to treat those above us as though we were working directly unto Christ. That didn't, notice it doesn't qualify saying, well, if they're nice to you, if they give you good bonuses, if they have a lot of benefits. It just says those that are over you. Okay? As a matter of fact, Paul even goes so far as to say, hey, even if they're not good to you, you still need to work unto me, Christ. Okay? So, how you go about earning matters. We talked a little bit about the responsibilities that we have under our government. Our government requires that if you make X amount of money a year, you've got to report it. And they take their share. Jesus reiterated this point when he said, hey, give to Caesar whatever is Caesar's. Okay? Because Jesus understands money is not that big a deal. Okay? God's got an unlimited supply. You need extra? He can send you fishing. And you'll get extra. Okay? So, if, if you're trying to pad your pocket by robbing Caesar, you are stripping away God's blessings. Okay? Trust God. Render unto Caesar what is His. Give to God what is His. God will bless you. Okay? Uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that Jesus, uh, 11 of His parables dealt with money. We talked about there are in excess of 200 verses that deal with insight and direction on how to deal with money. It's important, folks. And, and I know we can get caught up in kind of the tedium of it. I mean, uh, quite honestly, I like, I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm like Vice President of Nerds Anonymous. Okay, so I like the columns of numbers and, and I love it when it works. I hate it when it doesn't work. Okay, when I get to the end and zero happens before the rest of the bills, I hate that because then it's out of my control and I got to trust God. Okay, so we look at this. 
this is so significant because I am absolutely convinced in our society, in our culture, that one of the greatest idols that we have is money. Mammon. And, and the, the term mammon conveys more than just money. It conveys the idea of stuff. All that you have that money buys. Okay, so it's not just the almighty dollar. It's what you want to use that dollar for. Okay, and I believe that God is laying out before us, um, look, you have a choice. You can serve me with all that that entails, or you can serve this false god, this idol of money, and all that that entails. And I guarantee you, this is going to make you happier. This is, this is what God says. My way is better. Okay? Um, how many of you here own a vehicle? How many of you here want to own a vehicle? <laughs> Come on, Kelsey. That is. Nathan, Luca. Yeah, okay. Joey. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now, when the manufacturer made the vehicle, they gave you an owner's manual. Who in here besides me has read the owner's manual? <laughs> Thank you, fellow nerds. <laughs> nerds unite. Okay? Now, this idea is a little bit preposterous, but what if you decided that you didn't want to put gasoline in your car? I'm not going to the... I have, I have a religious revulsion to gas stations. They're of the devil. I'm not going to use them. Why should I go there when I have a perfectly good garden hose at home to unlimited water. And if I, I'm plugging the what, what's going to happen to your car? It doesn't work. And if you take that car back to the manufacturer and say, hey, this thing doesn't work, what are they going to say? Drain the water. You didn't use it as advertised. You didn't use it according to its specifications. Read the manual. Read the manual. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I shared the example of, of my son whose engine light came on. And he said, Dad, the engine's light on. The engine light is on. I said, yeah, you should probably go get that checked. Car's still running. Well, you know, the engine light comes on for a reason, even if it's the light's broke, you know. You go check it out. It's better to know, oh, it's just a little fuse than to have what happened to him. He was going to school in Missoula, and he made it back right there by the Kawasaki dealer between Lolo and, and Missoula. Clunk. <coughs> Clunk. Dad. <laughs> uh, the car broke down. And, and, and I, duh. <laughs> You're surprised? No, I'm stuck. <laughs> so he learned a hard lesson because he didn't use the vehicle as the Oh, the, the owner's manual as the manufacturer says the vehicle needs to be used. This is why God is so stressing money to us. It's important because it is a huge stumbling block. Okay? So, moving on from there, we talked about um, we have to use it effectively. Uh, Jesus calls us to be shrewd, to be astute in our dealings. We have to be shrewd in how we approach and handle money. Okay? And, and uh, we, we're doing the Financial Peace University. I, if you have not taken that class, talk to me. We'll do another one down the road here too, not too long. I, I really encourage you because one of the things that Dave Ramsey says is that if you do not assign a designation for the money, it will find its own way out. Okay? It's going to... Okay? If you don't tell the money where to go, it's just like our children. I had so many children in my house yesterday. And it was like somebody released a bunch of cats and then hosed them down with water. And they were... No! Mine! And, and then, they, you know, you turn and look at them and be like... And then they'd give you that sweet little look. Okay. Do you want a cookie? <laughs> okay. So we have to be shrewd. We have to use the gray matter between our ears in how we approach and we handle money. Um, 
We need to give generously. I'll tell you what, one of the things that more readily reveals your heart than anything concerning money is how you render unto God what is God's. Okay, it's all His. And if you start uh, prevaricating, you start um, vacillating, you start questioning, and, and you start quibbling, well, you know, um, this is one of the areas that uh, I disagree with a number of pastors on. They say, well, you know, hey, 8%. You know, if you want to tithe 8%, tithe 8%. You just said you're going to 10%, 8%. Do you realize that? If you tithe, tithe means 10%. And God says, bring in the full tithe, 10%. Okay? It's all His, and He is challenging you. He is laying down the gauntlet before you, saying, test me. I dare you. I double dog dare you. I triple dog dare you. <laughs> Test me. And I think it really reveals people's hearts in their relationship and the balance between their love for God and their love for money. Okay? 10%, um, God says off the top, that's mine. Give it back to me and see if I won't bless you. Watch, I will open the floodgates of heaven and I will pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. Okay? But then he goes further than that and he says, and, and you also need to look out for each other. You need to be doing offerings. Okay? You, you need to be doing offerings. You need to be doing alms. And, and when you are willing to do that, and we get to the point where we do that not grudgingly, God's compassion mine. When we can go, oh, thank you, God, that I have for you and for him and for him. And God, look, you've still blessed me with some. And Christy wants Taco Bell. <laughs> I'm still learning to praise him for that. When we get to that point, money has no hold on us. Okay? Now, we're still shrewd in how we pay our bills. We don't take on consumer debt. We pay things up front. We don't take on credit cards. We don't take on personal loans. We pay for things up front. We do it the way that God says so that we are not enslaved to the creditor. Okay? But when we can get to, to being generous with our money, when we can open up that white-fisted grip and let God use it as He sees fit, He can then start putting back into our hand what He wants to give us. Okay? This is not about get rich quick by using God. <laughs> Okay? God does not want you to be fabulously wealthy. He might want some of you to be fabulously wealthy, but with those people, there comes a great responsibility to use it as he sees, sees fit. Okay? Most of us can't handle that. Okay? We, we talked about the people who won the lottery, how 90% of them in less than 10 years are in bankruptcy. And it doesn't matter how much they get. It doesn't matter if they win a million. It doesn't matter if they win 300 million. The, the more they get, it just seems the faster they spend it. Okay? So... Give generously. You can't outgive God. Okay. Now, again, let me qualify that. That's not being stupid. That's not giving money to the folks at Starbucks. Okay. That's that's not giving generously. That's feeding a an addiction. Okay. You don't believe me? Try going to God for a month. And and we all have those. I'm not coming down. Uh, mine's Pepsi. Okay, I, I like my caffeine cold. You, you like yours hot. Okay, we all have them. So, give generously. Uh, we talked about multiplying his money. We, we said that Jesus is a demanding boss that expects a return on his investment and says that if you do not provide a return on his investment, you are wicked and lazy. This is what... God, this is what Jesus has to say to you. If you are not taking, not this money, we're going we're gonna to start with money because that's what we're talking about. But we're talking about everything that He's given you. If you are not working to bring a return on what He has given you, so when that 10 comes and He says, hey, time to settle accounts. This is what I gave you. What would you do? Well, God, I held on to it nice and tight and I kept it pretty. <clears throat> there it is, the church. And he looks at you and says, why didn't you at least give it to the bankers and return it with interest? That I might have profited. 
Okay? He wants you to provide a return on what he's given you. And then, then we talked a little bit about the rewards that come along with that. Okay? Because when the ten and the five gave him, he rewarded them. And he, he said, enter into your master's rest. Okay? And, and if you notice in both of those, when we looked in Luke and in uh, Matthew, uh, both of those, they kept not only what he had given them, but what they had earned. See? So, <clears throat> so we talked about multiply his money. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to read the whole chapter. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to pick some things out for you. Now keep in mind, this is Paul <clears throat> towards the end of his ministry and he is writing a letter to his beloved Timothy, his son in the faith, Timothy. And it's, it, you, you look at uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus as, as a father writing a letter to his son, giving him instruction and, and giving him wisdom. And in this case, sons, it would be uh, Timothy and Titus. Uh, kind of like Proverbs with Solomon writing to his son, wisdom. Okay, So when you look at it that way, uh, it, it kind of takes on a new life because Paul is writing wisdom and advice to Timothy, who is an up-and-coming preacher. Okay, And when you see what Paul writes to him, you can kind of get a feel for where Timothy was at in his walk and, and in his ministry. So we're going to read uh, chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 1. Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants, bond servants can be uh, a willing servant or a slave, regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound word of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I actually prefer another translation that says, pierced themselves with many griefs. Um, <clears throat> verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who is his testimony before Pontius Pilate uh, or who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from repro reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable, unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Postscript. Okay? Postscript. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. 
thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Okay, now, verse 17 is where we're going to kind of focus on today, but this whole chapter, this whole portion of, of Paul's letter to Timothy really needs to be taken into consideration as we look at this. In verse 17, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. You guys know what haughty means? Somebody give me a definition. Proud. Proud. Proud arrogant. Conceited. Conceited. You're, 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 you're snotty about what you've got. Okay? Um, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Uh, one of the key things that uh, we talked about is, is this competition that um, is between God and money. And, and we talked about the idea that God has provided it all for us. But I love the way that, that Paul writes us here. Um, how many of you are rich? Every person in here should put your hand up. Because according to history and according to the economics of today, we are a wealthy, wealthy people. Even at the bottom end of the United States, you are well ahead of 85 to 90 percent of the rest of the world in stuff. Okay? Um, open up your food pantry. Open up your refrigerator. If you have stuff in there, you're doing better than 50% of the world. Okay? If you have money in your account, you got gas in your car to get here, oh, you've got a car, that puts you above the, a significant portion of the world. We are rich. We have much stuff. So when Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, as for the rich in this present age, that's us. Perk up. Okay? Because what he's addressing is meant right for us. Okay? He says, charge them not to be arrogant, conceited, proud, haughty. Don't, don't, don't let them boast. I mean, what's there to boast about? God gave it to you. It's his. God gave me more. I mean, you know, when, when the parable of the talents... The one that got five, he didn't go, <laughs> you only got two, I got five. <laughs> one, really? One? <laughs> you don't even deserve to be on the same playing field as me. Go sit on the bench. Okay. We, we don't see that because they understood it wasn't theirs. It was his. Okay. The, the, the amount they were given brought with it a commensurate mm -hmm. amount of responsibility. Right? Okay, so it wasn't something to boast in, it was something to take serious and be responsible about. Everybody stop and look at my grandchild. <laughs> uh, Ron Blue, who runs a financial, a Christian financial institution, said the only certainty about economics is uncertainty. And this is... Uh, exactly what Paul is writing here. He says, uh, a little bit further down in, in 17, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Let that sink in for a minute. The uncertainty of riches. We are, according to the news, we are coming out of a major recession. I see signs of it. Montana being typical. Um, we kind of come into things after the rest of the, the United States do. It kind of is a little bit slower getting to us. And, and so I, I look around the valley and I don't see the prosperity that I hear about on the news. I'd like to see some of that here. No, actually I probably wouldn't. Because we can't handle it. But, but here today, gone tomorrow. Okay? And, and we take steps to protect ourselves and, and we, we use wisdom, we use shrewdness. We are astute in our dealings, but 
sometimes, just as happened to Job, God gave, <coughs> God took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay? The Lord is to be praised. Okay? So, we can't base where we are now on where we might be tomorrow. Okay? Because tomorrow we might even be in a better place. We might be in a whole lot worse. I think this is why one of the reasons that God in His wisdom designed the body of Christ to be a fellowship, to, to be knitted in, to be working together, so that when hardship comes, we can help one another out. We see that throughout the book of Acts, where the church in Judea and the church in Jerusalem was suffering hardship. So all the churches in Asia Minor took collections to send down to help out the brothers in Judea. Okay? And, and there, there needs to be an ongoing awareness of this. I love this church because this is one of the most giving churches I have actually, not one of. This is the most giving church I have ever been a part of. Okay? That, I say that to commend you. Um, we, we needed 100 dozen cookies. Next Sunday is potluck. Don't bring dessert. <laughs> we have got lots of cookies. We needed 100 dozen. Um, how many would you say we ended up with yesterday? At least 125. Yeah. Yeah. Exceedingly abundant. We ended up with a lot more than we needed. And, and I think that speaks well of this church. When there is a need, this church steps up to meet it. And, and I think that is why it is so significant. God said, hey, look. I'm going to orchestrate my church. I'm going to make it a body. And each part is going to be dependent on the other parts. That's why it's so important that we get knitted into a fellowship. That we have transparency in fellowship so that when I am hurting and I am in need, you guys can step up and help me. And when you are hurting and you are in need, we can step up and help you. Well, I, I got a confession to make. This week I've been a grouch. Yeah. Again, uh, you know, it, it's interesting because that used to be just the normal state of affairs for me. But now it just comes in phases. And I had absolutely no reason to be a grouch. I just found myself just, you know, things that don't really bother me just would make me go, you know. And I was just edgy. And I, I, I went three or four days. And then God kind of opened my ears to the things that I was spending my time thinking about and saying and I realized that I had fallen back into this kind of grumbling spirit. And I told Christy, I said, well, she was already aware because she's a lot brighter than I am. <laughs> she actually listens when I talk. Well, I don't. I don't usually listen when I talk. And, and so she was kind of already aware. She was probably already praying desperately, God, would you please get him out of this? But I, I told her, I said, you know, I, I don't know what's going on. There's nothing particularly that's bothered. Well, everything's bothering me. But I don't have a reason for everything to bother me. So please pray. You know, just we, every night before we go to bed, we do our bugger scale check. Okay? And we get together and we do a bugger scale check and you have a number from 0 to 10. 10 being the absolute best you've ever been in your life. I have never been at 10 because I'm expecting that to come sometime down the road. <laughs> and, you know, 1 being the absolute worst. And every night we, we do, okay, bug a scale check and evening prayer requests and we each go and give our number and, and, and if it's not a normal number, we explain why and then we do prayer requests and, and we pray for each other before we go to bed. And, and I told uh, Christy and, and Thaddeus, I just, I'm just edgy and I don't know why, I just, you know. And it wasn't a good week to be edgy because I had a lot of stuff to do where I had to be around people. <laughs> and people don't help my not being edgy, you know. And so I just, I said, look, I, 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 need, I need you guys to be praying for me because I'm just, just, and there's no reason. Now, I woke up this morning for the first time this week and I wasn't edgy. You know, I wasn't tense. I, was, I wasn't anxious. So um, that's part of what the body is for. When we have a need, we speak it to others and they can intervene and intercede and help us with this, okay? So we don't depend on the uncertainty of wealth but we do depend on God. You see, he says, uh, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now that phrase right there, I want to talk about. Because in the church, we see two extremely diverse opinions on stuff. Okay? We have this opinion uh, about 
uh, stuff on the one extreme, and you guys are going to be this extreme. So you guys today, you guys are the ascetics. Okay, do you guys know what that is? No. no. I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> now you guys, you're going to represent most of the United States, and you're the materialists. Okay, so the ascetics, the materialists. Now I know we all fun, fall somewhere in this scale. Being in America, we probably fall more likely in this direction than in this direction. But you'd be surprised. Um, let, me, let me give you my definition uh, for ascetics. Um, asceticism is a belief in rigorous self-denial and suppression of physical satisfaction to gain God's favor and to heighten the enjoyment of God's fellowship. Okay? You want, you want me to give that to you again? What's that? <laughs> can, can they? Be? <laughs> no. <laughs> you have, you're already in the wrong place, Terry. <clears throat> Asceticism, a belief in rigorous self-denial and suppression of physical satisfaction to gain God's favor and to heighten the enjoyment of God's fellowship. Okay? It's this belief that if I get rid of stuff, that we, we see this a lot in um, the, the monasteries and the abbeys and the, the Catholic Church. You know, if I just remove myself from all of that temptation, God will be pleased with me. But there's a problem with that thinking. Um, flip, keep your finger here on 1 Timothy. Flip with me over to Colossians chapter 2. Now, a couple years ago, we did a study in Colossians. Uh, we talked about one of the reasons that Paul was writing to the church at Colossae was the uh, pre-Gnostic movement. Gnosticism carried with it a, a number of points, one of which was that all material stuff was bad, which included, like, your body. That, that this, this idea that only spiritual was good, all physical was bad, and therefore we want to try and divorce ourselves of the physical as much as we can. Um, in chapter 2, uh, starting in verse, uh, verse 16, this is what Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. Um, chapter 2, verse 16, he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in regard of, uh, I'm sorry, in question of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from which the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you still were still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and, and severity in the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So... This whole thing right here, I'm going to break it down for you. Uh, asceticism thinks that you can do something to earn God's favor. You can't. Okay? Without the blood of Christ, there is nothing you can do to earn God's favor. And when He shed His blood, the grace of God, which overwhelms all of our sin... Not just yours, not just mine, but 
all sin, because if every single person from the moment of creation to the moment when everything is done, if every one of them confessed their sins, His grace would have covered all of it. Every bit of it. That's how exceedingly abundant His grace is. Okay? So it's not just the, the, the struggles that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in your life, the little things and the big things. It's everybody's struggles for all of time. Okay? That's how big His grace is. Okay? And asceticism insists that I can do something to make myself worthy. You can't. It, it, it's not possible. You don't have that ability. If you did, there would be no need for His Son to come and take our place on the cross. Okay? That's what Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. We're saved by grace through faith. Not of anything that we can do. Okay? So, going on here a little bit, he says, uh, Don't let anyone pass judgment on you on question of food or drink. I'm sorry about the comment about coffee. <laughs> or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Now, um, I have a brother that does not have a Christmas tree in his house. He, he doesn't decorate. They really, um, they don't do much of anything for Christmas. Um, and, and he has a problem with the lights and the bells and Santa Claus and, and, and all of that. And, and I, I think as with anything, it depends on where you're coming from. If you look at those as simple things, you're okay. But when you start to worship them, that's a problem. If, if your whole thing about Christmas is uh, getting your kids to go along with the Santa Claus and the Rudolph and the Frosty and Christ is left out of it, you're in sin. You're in trouble. Okay? But if the focus is Christ and, and we're exchanging gifts and representing the gift that He gave us and, and we have a right attitude about this, okay? You, you can't point out... See, I, I can't tell my brother, dude, you got to have a Christmas tree. <laughs> That's not for me to do. That is something that he is convinced that he should not do. But by the same token, he can't tell me, dude, you've got to get rid of the Christmas tree. Okay? Paul says right here, don't let anyone pass judgment on you regarding the festival of the new... Why? Why? Because those things are not what's important. These are just shadows of what's to come. The reality that we only see partially as through a glass dimly, the reality is Christ. Okay, that's where the reality is. And this is that continual thing where we go back and forth. What is the focus? If anything supersedes the focus of Christ, if anything becomes more important than Christ, you're in trouble. And it doesn't matter whether it's, it's Easter or Halloween or Christmas if it supersedes Christ, I get so tired of people that say, oh, you know, we shouldn't, you know, Christmas was actually a heathen holiday. And, and, and Easter and the festival of Beltane and, and the church just tried to take, you know, the, the evil. They're all God's days. Which day does not belong to Him? They're all His. So we're not trying to steal something that doesn't belong to us. We're taking back what is already God's. That Satan has tried to steal from God. The church has every right, not only the right, but the responsibility to take those days back. But we got to do it with the right focus. That doesn't mean that we go out on Halloween and we say, no, 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 no. Don't go out trick-or-treating door-to-door. Bring all your devil worship and, and zombies and, and Draculas and, and, and bring them to our church. Okay? Is there a problem with costumes? No. There's not really a problem with costumes. There's nothing in Scripture that says that there's a problem with costumes. As far as I'm concerned, all the stuff they wore in the Bible, that's costumes. Man, that, I don't wear those. You know, If I were wearing those, I would be dressed up. I would be wearing a costume. Okay? But it's the attitude with which we go into something. Alright? So, don't let anybody look down on you. Dennis, when you're eating your Snickers... Nobody gets to look down on you. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism. Oh no, we don't do those things. Bread and water only. They leech the fun out of Christianity. There's no joy. I'm going to deny myself everything so that I can be close to God. And let me reread this to you real quick. They are to set their hopes on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Okay? Um, you, you think that God wants you to be an ascetic? Now, you may be called to lay stuff down for a while. There was a, a lengthy period of time where I had to lay down particular things in my life that I like to do. I had to lay down reading for, for a number of years. Um, now, when I read, I actually, I'm, it's much more controlled. And, and I don't forsake the things that I should be doing so that I can read. Okay? Um, there are certain things that we have to lay down sometimes forever. Okay? Um, God and I are still arguing about Pepsi. Um, but... We understand that God is first. Okay? God is first. Our love, our devotion, our heart are His first. Okay? But then He has given us the things to enjoy with a right understanding and a right mind. Okay? So, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of the Heavenly Lights. Okay? Every good and perfect gift. Uh, stuff is just stuff. Okay? It's neither good nor bad. Money is neither good nor bad. It's the attitude that we have about it that causes it to be a problem or not in our lives. Okay? So, ascetics, drink coffee, have a piece of cake, lighten up, have joy, be happy. Okay? Now we've got to deal with the rest of us. The, the materialistic, okay? Um, this is the problem that we deal with significantly more often in our culture because it's everywhere. Keeping up with the Joneses. The Joneses. Um, I've told this story before. There was a period of time where Christy and I, uh, God was taking us through a very uh, hard test. And, um, we believed wholeheartedly that God was calling us to serve in ministry. Uh, the ministry that he put us in paid zero. And so we were both working numerous jobs and trying to work at this ministry and trying to do all the stuff that we felt like God was calling us to do, trying to get it all done at once. Okay. And, and it was hard. And there was a period where... And in the matter of just a couple of months, we suffered a miscarriage, we lost our apartment, and we lost our car. All within just a, a, a matter of, it was actually about two months, right, give or take. Um, and it was hard. And we needed a vehicle. We're living in the Bitterroot. You can't really walk anywhere to get anything where we were living and expect to be home before dark. Okay? <laughs> and so we prayed, God... You know, we need a vehicle. We need a, a way to get from here to there. And a gentleman in the church had a 1977 uh, Ford LTD Country Squire station wagon. Okay? The Griswold Mobile. Okay? The, it had the panel boards and everything. And it had a penchant for dying at the bottom of the hill, not the top. And it was a heavy, heavy car. And but it got us where we needed to go. Sometimes we didn't get to stop as we went by because the brakes were suspect. But I had a, a, a lady um, actually tell me that that was not God's blessing. And I'm thinking, how is that not God's blessing? We didn't deserve a car. We couldn't pay for a car. We had no means of obtaining a car. And God said, here, here's a car. Because that's old and run down. God wants you to, and she had a, uh, a Lincoln Town Car. Uh. That's the kind of stuff God wants his children to have. Uh. 
I'll let God and her take that up. But I know when God put that car in our driveway, we were worshiping and praising and thanking God. Okay? I wasn't caught up with, you know, I need a particular kind of car. I needed something to get our family safely from point A to point B. And God gave us that. Okay? Um, in our society, I, I don't very often watch TV where there are a lot of commercials, but I, I told you last week or the week before, uh, I was amazed in watching these commercials, how many of them came from the perspective that you deserve it. Everything from you deserve a break today to you deserve uh, a nice car like this, you deserve to look like this while you drink this beer. Um, what and not like the pictures that they were showing. What do we deserve? In light of God's word, we deserve to be bereft and destitute and cast out. That's what we deserve. We're Americans. Oh, by God, we're Americans! We are a cut above. We are a notch higher. We're in trouble is what we are. We're in trouble because God has poured out blessing after blessing after blessing on this country and we've turned our nose at Him. And that, that's even in the church, folks. You know, Our solution to everything is throw some dollars at it. Billions of dollars have been thrown at, at problems all around the world. And you know what? Haiti is still struggling to feed itself. There are still people in uh, uh, countries all over the world that are suffering natural disasters. Uh, we are not making significant gains as a sending body into the world missionary-wise. Not that the church is not growing. It is growing. But it's not because we're sending people out. Okay? Materialism is the idea that more is better. Psalm 62, verse 10. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. It says, uh, Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. But then it says, If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Don't put your heart on the riches. We look to the provider, not the provision. Okay? Um, just flip back to 1 Timothy because I want, I want to make a couple more points here real quick <clears throat> the writer of Psalms uh, just warned us not to set our heart on, on being rich uh, verse 9 Paul is saying the same thing to Timothy he said, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But those who desire to be rich... I don't want a, a, a verbal answer. But if we were to make a mental list of the things that we desire most, I'm sure somewhere on that list, God would be. A better relationship with Him, uh, uh, greater intimacy, uh, they're, they're somewhere on that list. But if that's not at the top of the list, you're in trouble. And, and we all struggle. I struggle with it. There are days when I go through and, and uh, quite honestly, I get to the end of the day and go, man, God was not at the top of my list today. Man, I had a whole bunch of stuff that I put way ahead of God. Okay. But the desire to be rich, to have more, and, and that's the, the, the American attitude. How much do you need? More. Just a little bit more. Okay. If you walk away from this, this, this series, 
from a spiritual standpoint, I want you to take the lesson that money, the love of money, is setting itself in opposition to the love of God. Okay, you cannot serve two masters. If God and money are vying for your attention, you will soon come to love one and hate the other. Or love the other and despise the first. Okay? That's the spiritual. The practical aspect of it, if you walk away from this, this is what I would like you to take away from this entire series. The practical aspect of this, spend less than you make. Okay? That's the practical. If you have a, a budget of $1,000, that's, that's what's coming in in a month is $1,000. Spend less than a thousand. Okay. Now, see, I talked about the the time Christy and I were in with the, the Ford LTD. God brought us out of that time. He delivered us out of that time, but we didn't learn the lesson. And so, some 11, 12 years <clears throat> later, God took us right back through the same series of lessons. We lost another child. We miscarried again. We lost a vehicle, and we were on the verge of losing our house. But that time, I believe that we passed the test because we said, God, it's all yours. You take what you need. We, know, we trust that you're going to put us in a place, with a shelter over our head. We trust that you're going to get us wherever we need to go. It's yours. Take it. Do what you want with it. Okay? And God stepped up, and he did incredible miracles. Okay? God did incredible things. So, the love of those who desire to be rich fall into temptation you're caught in a trap. Okay? Now, some of us, it might be a little mouse trap stuck to our finger, which I tell you is not a pleasant thing. Okay? Some of us, it's a bear trap. And it's got us hard and fast. Okay? We're in a trap. Deliverance only comes by letting that go. Okay? And it's a conscious effort. You're not going to get out of the trap by just going, okay, God, well, you just take care of it, la da 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 and you go about and nothing changes. It's a conscious effort going back through this. You know, I've been working for years and years and years to get this, and that's got you so bound up that you're, you're unable to give generously. You're unable to do those things that God has called you to do. And, and it goes well beyond money. It goes into stuff. It goes into priorities. Okay. But it, you're caught in a trap. And you call out to God to deliver you from the trap, and you keep calling out to God to deliver you from the trap, and you keep calling out from God for God to deliver you from the trap until you are delivered from the trap. And then you call out to God to keep you out of the trap. <coughs> okay? It, it doesn't just end there. You, you keep calling out to Him so you don't fall back into the trap. And that's my prayer these days, is that Christy and I never fall back into the trap that we were in twice in our married lives. God, I don't want to go back there. It's all yours. Take what you need. Help us to be wise with what you've given us. <clears throat> Verse 10. This is, this is one of the most misquoted verses that I've, I've, I know of in the Bible. Mm -hmm. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. How is that often quoted? All the money, money is the root. Money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. King James says that. Money is the root of all evil? Yes. Read it. It's uh, 1611. For the love of money is the root of all evil. All evil. But that it's the love of money, not yes. money. Yes. Yeah, the that's what I'm saying. Money. money. Right. Money is not in and of itself good or evil. It simply it's is. It's the heart attitude that you take to money. What does it bring up in you? Does it drive you to God or does it drive you away from God? Does it not affect you one way or the other? See, my, my goal, my heart, is that we would all get to the point where money would not affect us. Hey, you know, Paul said, whether I have much or whether I have little, I've, I've learned to be content. Which indicates he had both much and at times had very little. Okay? And, and ascetics, you need to maybe let go of having a little. And materialists, we've got to let go of having much. Okay? And we've got to set God at the heart center of everything that we do with money. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
Father, we bless you today and we thank you that you care enough about us to warn us of the pitfalls, the dangers, the traps of this life, those things that we will face, those areas that we will stumble. You've set it down in your word for us to read, and Father, we are asking that you would birth it in our heart, that it would grow, that it would take root and produce good fruit in us, Father, that we would no longer have competing desires in our heart, but that our desire would be first and foremost for you, everything else after, and even willing to let them go as you direct, as you would lead. We thank you, Father, that you have given us godly men who give us godly counsel on how to use money and <clears throat> not let it have hold of us, that have given us godly counsel on how to get ourselves out of trouble when we've gotten into trouble. Father, you don't give us a warning without giving us a way out. So, Father, I pray right now, if there are any in here today that are struggling with money, Father, whether, whether it be with debt or just the love of, the desire, I am asking, Lord God, that you would quicken in their heart your desire for them to, to set them free, to deliver them, to take them out of bondage and set the captive free. That, Father, we would walk in that freedom, that we would no longer be tempted by these things. That, Father, in all things we would give you honor and glory. And we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.